Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Brianna, for helping always so beautifully um, in producing Solo Arts Heal. Um, I, I have so been enjoying all the March Dream offerings. I mean, what could be more fun than Bingo Night with Josh Kornbluth and, and uh, Candace Johnson, Fitness Sings, and, and Stephanie's March Dream. They've all been fabulous. So this has been a wonderful opportunity for all of us. And I'm really happy to be able to present Solo Arts Heal on March Dream. This is a vision born from artists inspiring true stories about overcoming adversity, surviving mental and physical challenges, and becoming their own health advocates and survivors. Many of these artists showcase at regional conferences around the globe, including terrific arts conferences held annually in the US and Canada, and, and at APAP, the Association of Performing Arts Presenters um, annual conference in New York, where um, the Marsh founder and artistic director, Stephanie Wiseman, has been joining me for the last few years, and uh, along with several outstanding solo artists that have been showcasing there, so many marvelous solo shows. And Solo Arts Heal highlights artists with shows about their personal medical struggles, physical and mental struggles, including different cancers, uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder uh, with Adam Strauss and sensory integration disorder um, and sexual violence. Uh, and a few weeks ago, we discussed that with uh, Joanna Rush and she'll be coming back with her show Kick. We also discussed um, about domestic violence that has been alarmingly on the rise during the COVID lockdown. Um, in the coming weeks, we're gonna be hearing from Jenny Allen in her show, um, I Was Sick, Then I Got Better, and Bob Brader um, in his terrific show, Smoke. And, um, and also next week, I'm really thrilled that we're going to have um, a jazz vocalist, author, and arts educator, Fred Johnson, uh, we'll be discussing a number of things, um, including uh, PTSD and his marvelous work with veterans. All these terrific shows um, right now are available uh, through Marstream, and we're able to effectively create community outreach, as we hope to continue to do with presenters and medical institutions from coast to coast, to reach audiences that can use real information and advocacy and valuable resources about a variety of medical issues, but through the arts. Delivered as drama and comedy, there's always humor, laughter is the best medicine, and grace, grace is always at the heart of these life-changing stories, perhaps especially now during this COVID lockdown. So we're all grateful to have the opportunity to share these stories and the wisdom they offer to audiences and in talk backs with special guests, expert in their field and audiences um, will enjoy the same tonight. Um, perhaps again, especially relevant at this, at this time of the global pandemic. Tonight, on Solo Arts Heal, we're thrilled to have with us a true Martian who has enjoyed extended runs at the Marsh, writer, producer, and actor Diane Barnes, featuring excerpts from her award-winning solo show, My Stroke of Luck, a captivating and inspiring story about forging a new identity after a debilitating stroke. Um, her um, performance or excerpts will be followed in conversation in audience talkback with our guests, Patricia Gill, Executive Director of the Schurig Center for Brain Injury Recovery, and Dr. Richard Delmonico, Director of Neuropsychology and, um, at the Kaiser Foundation Rehabilitation Center in Vallejo. But first, let me tell you a bit about Diane Barnes and her show, My Stroke of Luck. After surviving the catastrophe that inspired this show, Diane discovered improvisation Yes, and the mantra of improv, which we all should follow. Yes, and. And it opened an alternate universe for this, hmm, show me the evidence, skeptic scientist. Diane's first solo performance shared her experience negotiating the hurdles to single parent adoption. Audience response galvanized her with the power of storytelling and launched her new career. Diane left the practice of medicine and diagnostic radiology in 2010. Now a Meisner-trained actor, Diane completed the American Conservatory Theater Summer Training Congress, studied with Anna DeVere Smith, Ann Randolph, Keith Johnstone, and the Dell Art School of Physical Drama. Diane has appeared uh, at the Marsh, Ross Valley Players, College of Marin, Studio One, Bats, Improv, and Pan Theater. And in addition to runs at the Marsh, SF in San Francisco and in Berkeley, My Stroke of Luck had sold out run at the United Theater Festival in New York City, 
played at the Atlanta Black Theater Festival, the LA Women's Theater Festival, Canadian and US Fringe Festivals, hospitals, stroke centers, and universities. Diane uh, is a New York transplant, third generation physician, and a graduate of Stanford University and Yale University School of Medicine, board certified in diagnostic radiology. In her March uh, encore performance at George Washington's Medical School was her first performance canceled by the pandemic. Uh, Diane is available for keynote speeches and you'll find out more information um, on her website and that'll be put up in the chat along with other resources that we'll provide for you. Um, uh, Dr. Weinman, the legislative chair at the California Neurology Society said, that the show provides astonishing insight into neurological recovery. And Theatris said, my stroke of luck makes magic. No other show brings us as close to the heart of what matters. She has an amazing long list of impressive press reviews. So now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a performance of excerpts from her solo show, My Stroke of Luck, Diane Barnes. It's Saturday, July 2nd, 2005. I'm off for the holiday weekend, no beeper, and not a chance of being called back to the hospital. My boys, now 12 and 14, have gone to see War of the Worlds. So tonight, I'm flying solo. The evening is glorious. The sky painted orange and red as the sun nestles into the horizon. Mosquito hawks swirl in the bright fluorescent lights of Novato Horseman's Arena. And tonight, for the very first time, I'll be competing on my own horse, Dr. Z. He's mine, all mine. We start in a gentle lope. He spots the herd and the way he tosses his head and neck. He is one cow pony, happy to be back at work. I've spent the last three months getting to know Dr. Z, and now we're a team with me, the head honcho, which is pretty amazing. This 1,500 pound tank of muscle, a huge prey animal, the largest eyes of any land mammal, primed to flee from danger, has accepted me, a apex predator, my opic, as his leader. I look right, Z takes me right. I look left. He veers left, little squeeze of my thighs, we pick up speed, lean back, pull the reins, whoa, and we stop on the proverbial dime, and then a little kick, and we're loping again, all muscle and readiness. Tonight is my night. We're gonna win this one. Suddenly, Z slows to a walk. Hey boy, come on, pick it up. He turns right, hey, hey, crosses the arena, stops in front of Jimmy, our veterinarian. Hey, Diane, you're supposed to be warmed up. Is there a problem? Well, yeah, no, I don't know. Z has a mind of his own. I dismount. Oh, oh, I have the worst headache of my life. Surely only a lightning bolt could feel like this. But the starry night sky is clear. I know, and Z knew too, sensed before I had a clue. Diane, you need help? Jimmy, standing beside the horse trailer. How'd I get from the arena here? I don't remember moving. Z, snorting in my ear. Wiggly, ropey things in my hands. No, Diane, you're a doctor. You can't be a patient. Just pull yourself together. This will pass. Let me tie him up for you. No, Diane, escape now. No. No, I don't need help. Jimmy takes the squiggles from my hands, ties Z to the trailer. Oh, oh. Reigns, 
How did I not know that? Are you okay? No, Diane, don't let him know. He'll call an ambulance and send you to the hospital. Be quiet. No, Jimmy, uh, I'm fine. Thank you. I, I just need to lie down. The next thing I know, I'm lying down in my car in the parking lot. Searing, white hot lightning. Oh, my boys at the movies. I need to get home. No, Diane, don't let anyone know. Don't let them take you away. You can't die here away from your children. You better get home. I lie there a long time. How long, I have no idea. I'm afraid to blink, afraid to move. Then we're shutting it down now. You sure I can't call you an ambulance? No, thank you, Jimmy. I'm fine. Well, I wish I let someone call an ambulance or that someone there could see that my brain was already injured and my thinking impaired. But I'm a doctor, and no one there was going to second guess me when I said, I'm fine. How many people had come into my hospital complaining of the worst headache of their lives? How many CT scans had I read diagnosing devastating strokes? like this one. Now this image is uh, from an axial slice of a CT scan, which means it's done in this projection. This huge white blob is blood. Hemorrhage, hemorrhagic stroke, or hemorrhagic infarct. Infarct meaning dead tissue. This much blood in the brain, that tissue is dead. The black ring and the fingers is brain swelling or edema. And yes, this is bad. But that's my job. I'm a radiologist. I look at images to find bad things. And no, this one is not mine, or I wouldn't be standing here in front of you. How many of these patients had I followed in the ICU, comatose until their deaths, or until transferred to a nursing home in a permanent vegetative state? You see, I knew that at my age, with zero risk factors, my stroke was likely from a burst or ruptured aneurysm. Now, an aneurysm is a balloon-like outpouching of a blood vessel. And the moment it bursts, a piece of brain turns to current jelly pudding, kind of like this. It's gone. My chance of surviving the first 24 hours 50-50. And if I survived, my chance of living without long-term permanent sequelae, one in three. So death was looking like a pretty attractive option. And I confess, in those days, I was not a glass half full kind of gal. I drive home, take eight 400 milligram Motrin, strongest thing I had in the house, and go to sleep. And as I do, I know I'm choosing to have my children find me dead in bed in the morning. Now it might spook them. They might not want to ever live in the house again. But isn't that better than coming home to an empty house, worrying all night? Your mother disappeared into the bowels of the hospital system on life support in an ICU where children are forbidden. Or if I don't make it, and a squad car pulls up to give them the news, or drives them to the coroner's office to identify me in a drawer with a toe tag. 
pretty grim black and white thinking? Absolutely. But if you're a single parent, you love your children more than life, you're sure you're going to die, and your brain isn't working, well, shh, spoiler alert, I don't die. I'm sure you've heard the sayings, a physician who treats him or herself as a fool for a patient and doctors make lousy patients? Well, ta-da! Exhibit one. But there are reasons. Those of us in the allied health professions have seen more than we'd like about being patients. We've seen suffering and we've caused suffering in our attempts to heal. We've seen death, and we've seen or been party to dubious, invasive attempts to cheat death. We have definite choices about how we want to live and die, and only wish the rest of you did as well. More than two thirds of us have advanced healthcare directives or living wills. Do you? Statistics tell me 60% of you, more than 60%, do not. And if you're of color, 94% do not. So say you have a sudden severe brain injury. You no longer recognize your loved ones. A ventilator is keeping you alive. You won't get better. Is that what you want? Who would know? And who will speak for you when you no longer can? Where am I? It's not the hospital, but I know this place. Is it my home? But the walls, the colors, the pictures, they're all off like a messed up rainbow. Am I dreaming? Oh. <laughs> a shaggy gray and white faces in mine breathing hot air, black nose, big pink tongue. Oh, it licked me. I'm awake. Dog, my dog, Nooper. No, Nooper was my first dog in college. This isn't Nooper. Shaggy dog pictures flash like a flip book. The page stops. I'm standing in front of the Christmas tree between my two sisters. I can't be older than five. I'm crying. My younger sister, Bonnie, is holding a big shaggy gray and white stuffed dog. She's beaming. Then we're at dinner mother holding court at her usual position at the head of the table. <laughs> well, Diane had been bothering me about getting a fool dog. <laughs> oh, she wanted a dog, had to have a dog, couldn't live without a dog. <laughs> well, I decided to fix her. <laughs> oh, you should have been there. <laughs> Under the tree, Christmas morning, a big shaggy dog. Well, Diane came running, arms open. And when she saw it was stuffed, I picked it up at FAO Schwartz. She let out a wail and burst into tears. <laughs> you should have been there. <laughs> she said, 
<laughs> I didn't mean that kind of dog. I meant the kind of dog that makes BMs in the street. BMs in the street? Can you imagine? <laughs> That's exactly why we'll never have a dog in this household. as if all God's creatures don't make BMs somewhere. But growing up in Manhattan, middle class and black, or Negro as we were then called, there were so many rules and expectations in our family, all to keep us on the safe side of respectability. Barkley! This dog is Barkley. <laughs> I've had lots of dogs since Barkley. They've all been shaggy, gray and white. To heal that five-year-old broken heart with a real shaggy dog. How many more of my choices have been from seeds of a long forgotten past? Thank you. Okay, now because we did that, because we verified your email. Thank you. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Have you set? Woo! Wonderful, wonderful. I'm hearing some of his voices. Thank you. Beautiful performance, um, very moving. And um, Diane Barnes performing an excerpt from her solo show, My Stroke of Luck, which has performed to extended run runs right here at the Marsh San Francisco in Berkeley. Uh, Diane, I, I can't thank you enough for sh for sharing this life-changing and powerful story, your personal story of your stroke, an event that, that changed your life. It's changed quite a bit from doctor to survivor, advocate and performer. Absolutely, yes. If it weren't for that event, I might still be working. Um, and um, it absolutely reoriented my life. You know, it turned out to be a huge, huge gift. Um, it didn't feel like it at first. <laughs> the first year um, was um, uh, a nightmare. Um, um, rehab was the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, you know, they say being a single parent is tough, being an intern is tough, being a resident is tough, getting into medical school is tough, all that stuff. Nothing is like rehab, um, but consider the alternative. So um, I got back to work. It was a, a full year. I got back two hours a day, three days a week for a while, and then finally worked up to uh, three days. But it became clear to me that it wasn't where my heart was any longer. Um, and, um, and, and there were some issues with, of course, not pulling my full weight. Um, although I wasn't paid as if I were, but I, my, I was the, my work wasn't backfilled. Nobody was hired for the full-time equivalents that I was unable to perform. And so at, at a point, it just felt like it's time to move on. And um, I, the first thing I did was take a uh, class at Stanford, a continuing ed catalog came, Show Up For Your Life, an improv class by Patricia um, Marsden Ryan, Ryan Marsden, which was absolutely fabulous, a professor. Great at idol, yes. Yeah, and uh, one thing led to another and I ended up doing a lot of improv. The best improvisers were actors also, so I took actor training. Then I did uh, um, uh, W. Allen Taylor's solo performance class as part of my uh, work at College of Marin in acting. And that's what started this. Someone said, you have got to find David Ford at the Marsh. This is what you're meant to do. I found David Ford and the rest is history. The rest is history. Well, we're so, so glad that you're here to tell this story. And, um, and I have more questions about that, but um, I'd like to, um, 
bring in, I mean, there's so much to talk about um, your personal story, but also just about strokes. We want to talk about risk factors and symptoms and resources for our audience. And so I'd like to bring into the conversation our guests, Patricia Gill and um, Dr. Delmonico. But first, I do want to remind the audience that um, posted in the chat is the tip jar. It's also posted on the uh, main Marsh um, uh, web page. And because uh, the Marsh receives its funding largely through ticket sales and there are no ticket sales. <laughs> so we appreciate any support you're able to give. And also we encourage questions from the audience, um, which you may post in the chat and we'll answer as many as we can. Our illustrious producing director, Brian Williamson, will help us keep an eye on that. And so um, now please, um, I'd like to welcome um, Patricia Gill, um, MSMFT Executive Director of the Schurig Center for Brain Injury Recovery um, in Marin County in Larkspur. The Schurig Brain Injury Recovery Center is a nonprofit post-acute therapeutic center offering an array of affordable support services designed to help survivors and their family rebuild their lives after an acquired brain injury. The Schurig Center has transitioned to web-based support in this time of pandemic. And also, I'd like to um, welcome Dr. Richard Delmonico, uh, who is the Director of Neuropsychology and Northern Cal Regional Lead for Neuropsychology Services at the Kaiser Foundation Rehabilitation Center in Vallejo. So welcome, um, Richard Delmonico and um, Patricia Gill. Thank you, Gail. It's really lovely to be here, virtually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, so, uh, so many things. Um, first of all, actually, um, Patricia, tell us a little bit about the Schurig Center and what you do there. Well, I am the executive director at Schurig Center, and the organization has been around, we're turning 35 years old this year. So we started in 1985 by a single mom whose daughter was involved in a car accident, and she experienced a severe traumatic brain injury. And at that time, there were very few services at all for anybody who had a traumatic brain injury. And now there are uh, far more services happening at Schurig Center 35 years later. So we're a beautiful rehabilitation and therapeutic center in Larkspur in Marin County. And what the goal of the organization is, is to pick up where your healthcare system may have left off. So after you have uh, excellent rehabilitation care, and you're discharged home, we are the next place to go. So the services that we design and offer are to pick up and to help continue that rehabilitation process, help people cope with the adjustment to a changed life and often changed abilities. And the services are all on a sliding scale or free of charge, we turn nobody away. And it's a beautiful place with speech therapy and occupational therapy cognitive therapy support groups, and it's really a, a community amongst itself that helps people re-engage with who they are after an injury and to re-engage with the larger community and the life that they would like to live now after a stroke or a concussion or an accident. Now, do you have um, home visits as well, or do people go to your facility and are there beds there as well, or is it day patient? How does that work? Well, it's actually, it's an outpatient, so people come to the center. We do have occupational therapy where we go to people's homes to do that, but we're primarily group work at, and classes and individual sessions at the center. Not right now, so it's uh, all of our remote services are happening with um, virtual Zoom style calls and phone calls, and we're actually hosting nine of our services via Zoom calls, uh, which is pretty amazing, our, our team, uh, changed very quickly with a day's notice to closing our doors to clients and providing those services. So people come on site and they benefit from the connection with other people who understand. I think that's one of the things that we hear a lot is that after an injury and people feeling like their abilities and things have changed for them, that nobody really gets it. Nobody understands what they've been through. And at the center, they're around other people who understand what it's like to have something happen in an instant, like Diane described, that changes your life. And the camaraderie and the rehabilitation and the continued improvement of abilities and brain healing over many years is an incredible uh, thing to witness. And it's uh, what the center is designed to do is to treat people where they are 
and to support them for as long as they want to come or are benefiting. That's wonderful. And Diane, didn't you, when you were discharged originally after your stroke and you went home, you had two uh, teenage sons at the time, didn't I you? I did. And it was, um, and I didn't have all those services available. You know, I could walk with a cane and I could feed myself and toilet myself. And those are the three criteria for daily living that if any of those are absent, then you qualify for home services, otherwise you don't. So the fact, for example, that I had word salad and made absolutely no sense for months and was a so single parent of two, a 12 and 14 year old boys just did not compute. Um, and so I was pretty much on my own. Um, uh, ultimately a colleague, uh, my, I mean, my me main medical doctor um, tried to coordinate services, but basically finding the Schurig Center made a huge difference um, uh, because the services, I did have services at Vallejo uh, Rehab Center, my doctor hooked me up with that. But the idea, you know, there's a, a, an amount you have to improve um, for many of the medical models. Whereas um, at the Schurig Center, you only have to have the will to return to, to try to improve, to qualify for services. And that's a distinction that's important. There's a number of people who've come to my show have said, I was cut off after six months. They said, I'm not getting any better. I can't have services for whatever healthcare service, uh, you know, provider they had. And that's the difference between a lot of the nonprofit uh, stroke support groups. And we do have some, a list of some of them that we can put up in the chat. Um, but there are a number of resources that simply provide the services to people and families and caretakers who feel they need and want it. And that's huge, particularly at, at reasonable rates. And Richard, tell us some um... Tell us, if you would, about what, what, what your work is and, and um, what goes on at Kaiser um, as we get into talking about recognizing stroke system, uh, symptoms and so on. So I work at the um, Acute Rehab Center for Kaiser Northern California. So our catchment area is from Fresno all the way as far north as um, a little beyond Roseville. And if someone has a stroke or a brain injury or a spinal cord injury or a brain tumor or um, MS, some type of neurological problem, um, and they're in the hospital, uh, they typically at this point, they would see a rehab physician uh, called a physiatrist and often occupational speech and um, physical therapy. And those folks kind of advocate for people to come to acute rehab. So to come to acute rehab, you have to have rehab goals. And, um, and uh, the physician and the team have to kind of come up with a plan that they believe that you can kind of improve over a relatively short period of time because it's it's in the hospital. Um, and then they would come to the rehab center for anywhere from, you know, a week, two weeks, maybe three weeks. And then uh, when, when people no longer need those, you know, physicians around 24 hours, nurses around 24 hours, they don't need that, that level of medical care. We typically discharge someone home and they may get um, outpatient services or in-home services for a period of time, and then uh, and then they would trans uh, transfer to outpatient services, which is what Diane got in Vallejo after her stroke. She got some outpatient services in Vallejo. So I'm the director of neuropsychology, and basically I'm a psychologist that specializes in working with people who have neurological disorders, like a brain injury or a stroke, MS, brain tumor, those kinds of things. And, um, maybe to back up this a little bit, I think most people um, may or may not know about strokes. Could you, could you just speak a little bit to um, 
you know, there are two basic kind of strokes and, 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 and I think Diane also, um, uh, we have some information that we can offer to, to the audience about um, different risk factors and so on. Perhaps you could, could you tell us a little bit about the types of strokes that exist? Yes, well, there are hemorrhagic strokes, which is what Diane had. And they can be caused by an aneurysm rupture like the balloon that Diane popped. Uh, they can be caused by a, um, what's called an arterial venous malformation, which is basically a knot of um, arteries and veins that are malformed and over time they begin leaking or burst. Um, and um, also, people can have a hemorrhagic stroke because a blood vessel just bursts in their brain. Then there's a, another type of stroke, which is due to an infarct. And that can be caused by a blood clot or by plaques. And everyone knows that, you know, a common um, reason why people have a heart attack is because a plaque breaks off in an artery and ends up clogging an artery. Uh, in one of your coronary arteries and you have a heart attack. Well, the same thing can happen in your brain. And um, it's very important to know the symptoms of a stroke because it's very important if you're having a stroke to get medical care as soon as possible. Especially these days because we have, uh, we have medications uh, that can dissolve clots we also have procedures where um, they can go in with a catheter and they take this device that's kind of like a cor corkscrew through a catheter and they basically pull out the clot uh, that's blocking an artery and that can have uh, really dramatic effects actually. Uh, people can improve kind of very quickly after the, after the clot is removed. So time is really, so time is of the essence. Um, uh, time time is is uh, brain tissue basically. Yes, the average person loses 1.9 million brain cells every minute a stroke goes untreated. And um, maybe now's a good time to put up the two um, the the um, risk factors. No, first the um, fast the symptoms the signs of a oh, stroke. Oh yes. So. Um, Brian. Sorry, sorry, not that one. Okay. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> um, I'm sure probably most people have heard that acronym FAST. Um, and that has been the classic, but the last few years it's been modified to be FAST. And if in a minute we'll get the graphic up there. Um, That's FAST is when you, face, arm, speech, and time, is that it? That's it. And, um, and, and be fast. So face is the uneven smile, arm if there's arm weakness or leg weakness, um, speech if there's slurred speech or inability to articulate, um, and time, it's time to call 911 right away. But that missed, that's the traditional um, teaching, but the B adds, adds balance, um, and eyes, because a sudden loss of vision in an eye, one or both eyes or part of the visual fields of either eye is another sign and sudden loss of balance is another sign. So those are, any, and those are signs that the person observing the stroke sufferer is more likely to recognize than the person having the stroke. So observation is crucial and insisting husband, wife, significant other, whoever it is who's saying they're fine, <laughs> insisting on calling 911 and getting them to the hospital, regardless of what excuse they offer for what, what's going on, why the, the problem is happening, because they're not likely to be aware of it. Yes, uh, the thing that I would add is that, is that uh, you need to be insistent that they not just take a nap and sleep it off, because um, that that period of time that they're napping can mean the difference between a really great recovery and a very poor recovery. Absolutely. And, um, and the, the 
strokes that are amenable to treatment, the ischemic or infarct strokes, as Richard described them, um, are 80% of strokes. So it's 15 to 20% that are the hemorrhagic type that have a much worse prognosis. Um, and um, some of the risk factors, we have another slide for that, but risk factors for stroke, in particular ischemic stroke, are the usual suspects. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, diabetes, smoking, heavy alcohol consumption, physical inactivity and obesity, irregular heartbeats, including atrial fibrillation, and family history of stroke. So important to know those are risk factors. So to the degree that you can modify any of those in your life, you can reduce your risk uh, to some degree. But another, another point um, that Diane uh, brought up in her in her presentation was that she had the worst headache of her life. Mm -hmm. If someone says that to you, get them to a hospital right away. That's, that, that is a hallmark sign of an aneurysm rupture. Yes, uh, okay. and that or collapse are about the only signs you get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Either you have the severe headache or you drop. So okay. thank you, Richard. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, so um, I have a question here, somebody asking to um, address a little more about rehab. Um, like what, what, do you, what do you do? What about it is so challenging? What goals would you have in rehab? I'll just answer from the challenge, what's so challenging? Um, and then I leave it to the experts who, who really guide people. Um, what's so challenging is you know, or at least I knew, what my abilities were before. And the gap between where I knew I had been and where I was, was a chasm I could not see across. You know, in other words, I was a high functioning person, I was articulate, um, you know, I was a doctor, a single mom, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden I couldn't walk without a cane I couldn't um, talk, I couldn't express myself, nobody understood what I was saying. I couldn't, the, one of the things my son noticed the most is the phone would ring and I could not get to the telephone before it stopped ringing. And if I got a message on the machine, I could listen and listen, I could listen to a half an hour of it and I would not get any of it. And when I would try to dial a telephone number the dial tone would disappear. And this, well, I'm talking about landlines. I know kids don't know what this is. <laughs> but the, the landline, the dial tone would disappear before I could get seven digits. That's before we had to do 10 digits. So if you can imagine going from that to, and somebody says, okay, here's what you have to do to get back there. And it's, it's a Sisyphean, it felt for me like the hardest thing in the world. And each, every day I was on my knees in tears at my frustration because I could see that gap. Mm -hmm. And I will say there was one person in one of the groups at, at the Schurig Center who did not see the difference between where she had been and where she was. And what I realized was even though she was happier, a lot happier, her prognosis for improvement was zip. Because if you don't know that you're missing things, what do you, 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 there's nothing to work on and there's no motivation. Mm -hmm. So it was a blessing and a curse. And now I'll let the experts. Yes, Patricia, how about that in terms of the, the rehab and how, 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 tell us about that in your, from your perspective. But one of the things that I love about Diane is the way that she describes it is so, um, honest and, and understandable. And she speaks for so many of the clients that I've had the pleasure of working with for the past 12 years. And the ability to accept that this has happened, that abilities may have changed, even if it's temporarily while people are rehabilitating. The communication challenges are quite, um, quite jarring and affect families and affect relationships. And it makes it very difficult for people to maintain the life that they had, as Diane just described. 
So figuring out, well, who am I now? How do I communicate with the people I love? And how do I get back to some type of a life that I feel that I have some control, that I have some contribution to offer? And the organization uh, provides that, that place for people to come and to be in a safe, accepting environment. There's no judgment because everybody is on their own journey of trying to figure out and understand what's happened and what to do next. And as Diane shared, we have people who come to the organization who have had a very severe stroke and are not as aware. And then we have others who come to the organization who are very aware, even if they cannot communicate and they can't speak and say very many words, they are very aware of what's happened and what their challenges are. And to be able to have a place where you can come and have speech therapy and art therapy and support groups and continue to, to focus on what is possible is, um, it's, it's life changing. And it, it really makes people, you see the strength of their spirit, the strength of their soul, their, their um, commitment and their passion to continue forward just as Diane described and what she has done from using a cane to traveling the world and doing this play. And it's, it's quite phenomenal. Uh, to see what can happen. So we help people adjust and learn new ways of communicating. That's terrific. Um, Diane, um, someone uh, asked in chat, when, when, did you, when did you realize that when you were lying in your car, did you know you were having a stroke? How, when did you realize? Okay, so this is a very big do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, um, I actually, yeah, I, I knew I was having a stroke. And I, already, I had already picked out my pine box and saw me six feet under, you see. Mm -hmm. This is the problem. Um, you know, I had been, um, you know, I'm a radiologist. So I had been reading CT scans of people's stroke all the time. And we'd had um, a single mom, uh, a nurse in the hospital whose CT scan I'd been reading for six weeks or so. And so, in my mind, I saw myself there. Mm -hmm. And um, her child was too young to be admitted to see her in the ICU. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was no father in the scene. And, um, and so uh, there's a deep river in Egypt, right? <laughs> Denial. So I knew I was having a stroke. I expected to die because the odds were, you know, that would, is what would happen or be severely impaired. And I just could not wrap my mind around it. But I was already impaired. This is the problem. I thought I was thinking very clearly, oh, I'm gonna die, so let's set it up this way. And I, and I made it worse. I won't tell you, you'll see when you see, if you see, when you see the full show. But oh, I yes. yes, I was, yeah, I was very stupid and I should have gone in. Um, uh, by the time I did get in, the, bl the you know, blood was all around my brain, which could have given me, and into the ventricles, it could have given me, in other words, it wasn't just that spot, it had already burst, burst out, and so I could have, I could have killed myself, but here I am. Well, thank goodness, because, you know, you're, you're certainly made up for it, because all of the rest of us are benefiting from this show and from this conversation. Um, one question here, and I've always wondered, too, um, people, should you pop an aspirin if you suspect a stroke? Um, hmm. No, you should call 911. <laughs> <That's, laughs> because because um, a hemorrhagic stroke is made worse by any anticoagulants. Ah, and there are people whose ischemic strokes, even in the hospital, if they're treated with anticoagulants, have an extension of a bleed. So no, 911. Mm. There are some people for whom aspirin is suggested as a preventative check with your doctor and is a couple of baby aspirin. But that would be, a, no, if you think you're having a stroke, 911. Good, good. Best advice. And um, someone also said they know someone that had a stroke and had very little motivation to do exercises. Is there a motivation center in the brain that can be if affected, effective? Well, well, you know, from a cycle, well, there, there's a lot to motivation. And the brain controls every step in that process. I mean, one of the things that isn't that uncommon 
is that people have problems with initiating a behavior. So they know what they want to do, but the switch can't get flipped on. So commonly, those folks, if you kind of set them up in an activity that they enjoy, they'll follow through and, and enjoy it. But if you expect them to kind of initiate the behavior, they won't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of things that relate to motivation. Sometimes people are depressed. Mm -hmm. um, a, a very common thing after a stroke is at a very um, basic level, psychological level, is a grief reaction that, you know, like, like anything bad happening in your life, you, you're upset about it. You need to be upset about it. And part of that, like when you lose somebody close to you or a pet that you've had for a long time, um, or something major changes in your life, that grieving process helps us move forward. And that's what Patricia's referring to at the Schurg Center, is that these types of events completely reshuffle your life. And more commonly, as you, be, as you move through that grief process, you reprioritize things, stuff that seemed really important before your stroke, some of it isn't important at all anymore. Other things are much more important, and typically the things that are most important are relationships, interpersonal relationships. Absolutely. So that's, that's a, common, uh, a common thing that happens in people not only that have strokes, but you know, what I tell my patients all the time is, you know, everybody knows someone who's been successfully treated for cancer. And when you ask that person, what's that person like now? People will often say, they're just different. They look at things in a different way. Things, yes. certain things are just more important to them than they used to be. Mm -hmm. It's transformative experiences. It's a transform, it's a, it's a, it's an existential experience if you look at it from a strictly psychological perspective. And Gail, you know, there's it's good this. We looked at the need to recognize, I'm sorry, um, we looked at the need to recognize stroke, stroke systems and I just want to reiterate the importance to call 911. Despite the fear of COVID-19, I think that's really important. Yes, that yes very much so. Uh, do that everything has changed a bit with um, with COVID, and uh, I'm sure it's affected. You know, well, it affects all of us. Um, did you have something that you were going to say, Patricia? Oh, thank you. I was going to share. Uh, Dr. Delmonico was talking about how it's such a transformative experience, and it's an experience that's happening every 40 seconds in our country, hmm. and one that can happen as uh, Diane shared it can happen to anybody at any time so most of us know someone whose life has been changed uh, by a stroke and the fact that it does have an impact on relationships and people being able to go back to work or being able to maintain the same friendships that they had there is um, a major adjustment that happens and the question about uh, motivation center, Dr. Delmonico, I love listening to him talk. <laughs> when it describes anything, it just, it's so understandable and inspiring to me. Um, we have a woman on our advisory board, Maria Ross, who had an aneurysm at the age of 35. And she almost passed away. She re was able to recover, but right after she left rehabilitation, she went home and that was the last of her, her rehabilitation and she couldn't even do a load of laundry. And this was a woman who ran her own business. And mm -hmm. she described needing to have continued uh, therapy and rehabilitation for a longer period of time in order to get back to um, her life again in the way that she was able to live it. And she is now running her own business. She's written a book called Rebooting My Brain. And uh, she talked about exactly what that person's question was, is why can't I even get through a load of laundry? going to motivate herself to finish it. And sometimes you just, we need continued support and uh, help to get to that level. 
Well, you know, I wanted to add one thing when we're talking about strokes in 911. Sometimes it, the mini strokes or transient ischemic attacks, you still need to go in. If it happens, the slurred speech, and it clears up, that doesn't mean you're out of the woods. You're out of the woods for that second. You mm -hmm. still need 911. And in children and teenagers, strokes are increasing for reasons we do not understand. And the symptoms can be quite similar. In toddler, also, it could be a seizure. But in children and teenagers, these things are often overlooked or, or you know, it's like, oh, come on, stop malingering. And for, same for them. The treatment needs to be soon 911 in the hospital. No one is immune. Thank you. Um, I, we're, we're getting very, um, we just have a few minutes left, amazingly. The time goes by and there's still um, so much we could talk about. Um, there is a question, how long did it take you, Diane, from saying word salad to being so articulate now? Did you, did you, <laughs> you know, less than 100% before, before your stroke? Um, and how long did it take you? Well, it, it took a long time. The word salad, the worst of it was over in a few months. But the difficulty finding words, you know, I had to learn everything all over again. I didn't know sink and faucet and I, I didn't know, I had to relearn vocabulary, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it was, I mean, I've never gotten back to who I was, but um, I'm articulate enough. I, li I can live with this. <laughs> you know, um, um, you know I, I was, I didn't feel like myself or a self that I was okay with for about five years. It was a, a, a long uphill struggle. Um, and yeah. someone asked about your, your children um, faring during your rehab and, and how are they now? They're not, now they're good. They went, they went particularly my older son went through um, uh, a black night of the soul, um, but a therapeutic boarding school saved him. And uh, he was there for two years. And um, now the older one, he just came home from Madrid. He was, he's been teaching English in Spain for the last two years, but um, the lockdown there, he was teaching on Zoom and he said, I'd rather be home and teaching on Zoom. So oh, he, he's with me now and he's getting a master's in international tourism. Yeah, talk about time, right? <laughs> oh, <you're fantastic. laughs> international tourism and hospitality in Vienna um, oh, in the fall. So, and actually their situation is so much, I think he, I, he'll be safer there than here. Um, and uh, my younger son is good now. He is um, getting a master's in sports, uh, exercise physiology and sport. And um, he was a little, he was spared the worst of it because he was already in boarding school, his choice. Um, but it wasn't until he saw the play with his college roommates that he understood what I had gone through and what his older brother, Logan, had gone through with me. So. Well, wonderful mother. It sounded like they they're both turned out so beautifully and um, you handled all of this so marvelously. I'm very grateful that you performed tonight. And one thing I don't want to forget, uh, importantly, that we did want to mention, it was about advanced um, healthcare directives. Right. Now is the time. I mean, I, I, it's always the time. I, I get, encourage teenagers and young adults to, um, because otherwise someone else makes the choices for you. But particularly now, the, I mean, the first thing we did when this COVID came as a family is sit down and talk about my, my advanced health care directors, which I had, and we went over them again and reiterated my choices under the current situation. And I think it's so crucial, especially in this situation where family members are not in the hospital. You want to have spoken for yourself before you're in a position for nobody to speak for you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm so grateful to you, Diane Barnes, and um, and our guest, Patricia Gill, and, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Um, Delmonico. And I, I also would like to announce and let you know about the excitement we're going to have next week. Um, I'm really happy that uh, we will be presenting Frederick Allen Robert Johnson. He is um, a uh, jazz vocalist, a sacred chanter, director, painter, author, arts educator. And he is uh, someone that's open for both Aretha Franklin and Dr. Deepak Chopra. Um, it points to his versatility as an artist. He's an acclaimed um, vocalist and arch educator and has worked with um, many of the greatest uh, jazz artists in his time, but also 
Um, he's recognized globally for his work in the health and wellness community and was instrumental in establishing inspiring hearts and hope program at the University of Florida. His presentations on the healing power of music have caught the attention of internationally recognized holistic health practitioners and medical communities. And Fred also, he presents lectures and seminars all over the world. And we're um, thrilled that he'll be able to join us. And also um, as a Vietnam veteran, he has works with veterans and in issues of PTSD. It's some of the things that we're gonna be addressing next week on Solar Arts Heal. So again, um, I wanna thank you all so much for a very enlightening hour. And um, this will be cached. People will be able to see it on the website. Someone asked about a recording. And um, I look forward to seeing you next week.